everybody, and welcome to another Bruce Starr Show, the 80s golden age of comedy. And I am just having the best time just when I thought my life was going to quiet down, slow down here in South Florida. I have come back to my first love. I love the entertainment industry. I like the healthy part of the entertainment industry. I like the, the fun part of the entertainment industry. It's going through a lot of changes now. There's going to be a lot more changes going on. And I hope everybody comes out of it okay. But I left the entertainment industry twice. I was there in 81 to 86 during the golden age of comedy. Wow. And that was when evening at the improv just became one of the great shows on television. I don't know if everybody was watching it, but it went from comedy, stand-up comedy went from having some people at the improv and having some people at the comedy store to goodness gracious, being in everybody's living room in the country and maybe even parts of the world. And what happened when you put somebody on TV, you put funny comics on TV, people got in their heads, hey, I could have a comedy club in my town too. And if I'm quick enough, I could be the first one to do it. And right before my eyes, comedy clubs just sprung up all over the place. There was, it went from having, uh, you know, the improv in Las Vegas and, and uh, Melrose Avenue to literally a, a hundred comedy clubs spread out all over the country. And it was a great time. It opened up the door for me to become a personal appearance agent for these comedians. We became friends. And I tell this story every, you know, every once in a while, Barry Martyr, my roommate said, listen, why don't you book these guys? William Morris, ICM doesn't want to book them. They're working on big deals. They're working on movies. They're working on sitcoms. They're not going to book these guys and they don't want to book themselves. So I begrudgingly finally did it because not that I didn't want to be an agent, but I really wanted to be a personal manager. And Mark and I will talk about the differences between an agent and a personal manager. And although from the outside, it doesn't appear like there's a huge difference between an agent and a manager, but from the inside of the industry, it, there is a big difference. And Mark, my guest, Mark Miller, and I will talk about Mark Miller. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you back. I remember watching you on the improv, seeing you up on stage for years when I was out there during the 80s. So I'm so thrilled that you accepted my invitation to be on the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. Delighted to be here. I gave up uh, the opportunity to appear on The Tonight Show tonight because I made the commitment to you, but I, I think I'm, uh, it's important to honor my commitments and I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I, I just had one question. I was just wondering, as I see the title of this is the 80s golden age of comedy, I'm wondering if comedians in other eras, in other decades, think that theirs was the golden age of comedy. For example, in the 60s, maybe Woody Allen, Bill Cosby, George Carlin, people then, was that the golden age of comedy too? Or is every decade the golden age of comedy? You have a very, very good point there. My question to you was, all those guys that you just mentioned, they were the, the grandfathers of real stand-up comedy. Uh, would they say that the 80s was the, the 60s was the golden age of stand-up comedy? Or might they say the golden age of comedy when all sorts of comedy sitcoms, stand-up really started to explode and I think reached its maximum in the 80s? What do you think about that? You make an interesting point. Of course, they didn't have a lot of the venues for comedy in the 60s, so more things were happening. But uh, I, I guess we don't have to label each decade. Let's just, uh, we, we know the 80s, we love it, we came from the 80s, so let's just uh, celebrate it and not get into a boxing match with other comedians from other decades. We'll acknowledge every decade was wonderful in its own way, with its own limitations, with its own wonderful uh, venues. So uh, I'm just pleased to be alive and uh, safe from the coronavirus and uh, looking forward to a new president. Speaking of the 70s, 
Yes. That's when it really started to build into the golden age of the 80s. That's when I think the, co the, the comedians were roughing it. They hadn't hit the strike yet. And that was a turning point in the comedy world. I think it, in a lot of different ways. So, but before we get into the 70s, I wanna know who Mark Miller was, where you came from, and how in the world did a guy, a conservative kind of looking guy like you, that could probably run for senator. Oh, we also had a, com a, a comedian run for senator, of course, and did fairly well for a while. But how, how did you get started in comedy? Tell me a little bit about you. Uh, I'm from the East Coast, upstate New York, Rochester, Glens Falls, college in Pennsylvania. Moved out uh, after college to San Francisco because I didn't have any friends where I lived because my parents moved there when I was in college, didn't know anybody, didn't have any particular exciting job prospects. And I told myself, Mark, if you're gonna be friendless and miserable and unemployed, why not choose a really cool city to be that way in and start over? And I narrowed down my choice to Washington DC or San Francisco. San Francisco seemed to have the, the better weather, the better women, that sort of thing. Moved out there not knowing anybody and while I was staying at the Harcourt Residence Club in the Polk Street area, I, one of the other fellow residents, this is a place where you could rent rooms by the week or the month, uh, was a guy named Tony DePaul. And he was doing stand-up comedy locally at a place called The Intersection, a small coffee house in the basement of a church in North Beach. And he invited me to come along and see him. And I did, and I was just blown away because I had never seen people my own age doing stand-up comedy, only the professionals on the Ed Sullivan Show and the Tonight Show and things like that. And I thought, you know, I'm a writer. I, I enjoy writing. Maybe I'll do an article about this scene. Maybe other people in America would want to know too. And to gain the trust of these comedians, I'll, you know, start coming to open mics and the, and the little lectures that the head of the place was giving. I'll pretend that I'm an aspiring comedian and I'll get them on my side. They'll open up, I'll get great stories. And I started doing that and loved it so much. I eventually lost interest in doing the article and that's launched me into 10 years of doing stand-up comedy. And that's how it started. And people who heard that I was doing stand-up comedy were astounded because I was always a shy, introspective kid who got sweaty palms if he had to give a book report in class. But wow. uh, here, I here I was doing it. So how did you go from, uh, well, first of all, who did you see up on stage? Because a lot of the guys that I've spoken to, they remember seeing some pretty great guys up on stage and they said, wow. Uh, I'd love to do that some. Did you remember the first guys that you saw? Yeah, the, the people in my group that some people who like 80s comedy or know these people from the San Francisco or Los Angeles area might remember uh, Lorenzo Matawaran, who, who went by the name Buzz Belmondo. Uh, there, was, there was Bill Farley, uh, Gil Christner, uh, Billy Lucas. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, a couple of famous uh, people around then, um, uh, Bobby Slayton, uh, a couple of guys named Dana Carvey and Robin Williams. We were all in that basement of the church intersection coffee house where the guy running it would give us each a dollar at the end of the night. That was our payment. Wow. Wow. Gosh. And so you saw these guys go from pretty good to be up there to really putting their skills together on stage. Because what I'm hearing from a lot of the guys is there's no shortcut. You got to do it on stage. There's no other way to get better. Right. And even though when, for example, Robin Williams came in for the first time and just blew us all away, it wasn't beginner's luck. He had been doing, you know, 10 years of acting at the Juilliard School of Drama beforehand, combined, of course, with him being a comedic genius. But yes, you're right. You've got to put your dues in and, and, and do the work. And, uh, you know, some people followed the straight stand-up route and are still doing it. Some people segued into acting, some people into writing or uh, talent managing or agenting. 
um, producing or even other fields entirely. How did you put together your first five minutes or two minutes or three minutes and how did it go? So I started writing about myself, about my inability to have romantic success with women, about my relationship with my parents and started doing some one-liners about that combined with some goofy non sequitur stuff. I was influenced by uh, Woody Allen. He, he had a routine called the moose, an extended uh, fantasy he has about a, a, his interactions with the moose and that inspired me to be goofy in my own stuff. And you would come back and be given uh, five minutes on stage and do it and I would like everybody else, tape record my stuff and keep what worked and and delete what didn't and and add new stuff little by little. And so, obviously, you started from say uh, the mic, open mic, and then you started maybe uh, opening for some of the more seasoned guys. How how did that go from open mic to making your way up to the upper echelons of San Francisco? So in San Francisco at the time, and remember this was 1975, there weren't comedy clubs like we have now. So there was no opening for other comedians. It was, it was you know, six comedians on the bill for the night or, or, or whatever. But eventually leaving San Francisco and moving to LA, then you're on a bigger platform. And if you could impress uh, the right people and the right audiences, you'd be offered you know, better, better clubs, more money, opportunities to open for other people, that sort of thing. But uh, as you said, it, it, it just took the work and getting better each time. And some people, you know, there was a hierarchy of people with, you know, somebody like Robin Williams at the top, people that went from open mics to winning Oscars uh, for their acting and other people got, uh, you know, like Roseanne and uh, Tim Allen uh, getting their own TV shows. Some were just excellent club performers, got very high rates at that. And Jay Leno exemplified that for a long time till he got into TV. Other people did not get it past the audition stage at the improv and the comedy store. They were not passed to become regulars. So they either hung in there and tried to get better or they moved into some other aspect of, of life. So there was a there's a whole hierarchy of things where you could be in. And, and I'm in yet another uh, sub genre of those when things got well, a couple sub genres. One, I branched into writing. So I, I went from stand up to sitcom staff writing, variety show writing, and even journalism, uh, humor columns for the LA Times syndicate. But when TV reality shows came along and sort of squeezed the opportunities for, uh, uh, for stand-up and even for sitcoms because reality shows were cheaper to produce. Then I had to find another way of paying the bills because the work wasn't coming along. And I said, I'm a writer, I'm a good writer. Maybe I could write for businesses. And so I developed a whole other career as a copywriter. So I have parallel comedy writing and business writing uh, careers. Well, that's good. I mean, you're obviously a smart guy and you have to listen. I'm hearing the stories about in the last eight months, it was hard enough for guys of the 80s to be on the road or to be on the cruise ships. And then when that was taken away from them, it was really pulling the rug from under their feet in, a, right. in a, almost in a complete way. Have you mentioned the book before that was written about the comedians in the 80s, the wonderful book that they made the TV series from? I think it's called I'm Dying Up Here. You know, I have I remember seeing it and I, and I wrote it down and I haven't thought about it since I wrote it down to get it, but that's definitely something. But I did see uh, Zoe's, uh, Zoe Friedman and Bud and Mark's uh, 50th anniversary video yes. that can be seen on Amazon. It was very good. It, it ignited, ignited me. It got my fire all started up because uh, so many of those guys I knew and, and uh, maybe even represented. It was great. So let, let's go back, though, before we get too far ahead. I, I would love for you to tell me some of your memories about working with the guys back in San Francisco. Some of your funny things that happened or 
uh, interesting stories that might have happened working alongside uh, Dana or Bobby or, you know, whatever you remember. What about, uh, oh, no, go ahead. Let's start with that. Carrie Snow. Didn't Carrie Snow come from up there, too? Carrie Snow and, and Monica Piper, who, uh, when I met her, she was May Lee Davis, which yeah. is her real name. She changed her name to Monica Piper. Yes. Uh, there, there weren't many women at the time, but uh, they, they were among them, Carrie Snow and, and Monica Piper. Um, a, a lot of, you know, what was big at the time was uh, improv groups. There was, there was a couple called uh, Spaghetti Jam and Papaya Juice, and they were formed from the comedians that did stand up at the time. And we did, uh, we, we took audience suggestions and did improv. Robin was among us. And when, when you're on stage with Robin, as you might guess, you become stage scenery pretty much. Even if you are at the front closest to the audience center and Robin's in the back supporting, he could raise an eyebrow and, and demand the audience's attention. But we, we love that. So we were very close. I went to Robin's uh, wedding to uh, Valerie Velarde, his first wife. And uh, we all went to uh, clubs afterwards for, for dinner or drinks after the show. There was uh, some illegal substances being used from time to time. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a very fun time. I bet. And when did you say to yourself, I love San Francisco, I love the comedy scene here. But when did you say to yourself, I think I'd better make my way down to Los Angeles? Yeah, so in 1979, after four years of playing all the clubs I could there, uh, including the other cafe and the punchline, um, the intersection, there was a place called the Mustard Seed Coffee House in Berkeley. I said, I wonder, and, and comedians like uh, Robin and, and Bill Rafferty on Laugh-In, um, and real people, I think he was first, uh, they started making their way down to LA and I asked myself, maybe there are opportunities in performing and writing there that would be worth exploring. That seemed to be the trend. People little by little would take little side trips into LA and see what might be uh, available for them. So uh, that, that's when I went, 79. So what was that like? Because listen, anytime you make a change, it's kind of difficult. I want to hear about what it was like from the day you set foot in the Los Angeles area until you started making a little bit of progress? So I, I had a little bit of help because while I was still in San Francisco, uh, Jay Leno came through town and was booked at the Playboy Club in San Francisco. Went to see him and Jay would always come to the local comedy clubs wherever he was performing afterwards to check out the scene and occasionally do a, a guest spot. But he saw me there and he was very complimentary and said, come down to LA and I'll help get you on at the uh, improv. Wow. Uh, and so he provided that uh, entree and, and got Bud to watch me and, and I got booked uh, from that. And at the time, uh, Jay would uh, ride onto the sidewalk in his motorcycle, park oh, yeah. right there, come in with his, uh, his denim shirt and denim <laughs> matching denim pants and uh, just blow the crowd away. He was a fantastic, comedian. You didn't even get a sense of how amazing he was from his Tonight Show monologues, but he was truly the king of stand-up at the time. Oh, he was. And he, he had that motorcycle and he had that set up at the comedy store and mm -hmm. went down Doheny or whatever street that was and came over to uh, the improv. And I remember him taking that jacket off and parking that motorcycle and just walking in. And it, it was never like, I'm a big star. No, he was just walking in to do his spot. And, uh, yeah. you know, the, everybody just cleared out a little bit to give him his, uh, his way. He was a great mentor, as was Tom Dreesen, who was a mentor to almost everybody there and is, is still performing, a wonderful comedian. Wow, wow. All right, so, so here we are, we're at the improv. You're looking around. Uh, what was your first interaction with Bud that you could uh, remember? I was intimidated by him. You know, he wore a monocle. He wasn't particularly a warm person. He, he was always telling people to get out of the way of the hallway leading into the, the showroom. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, would, would linger there and talk there. So uh, I, I, I pretty much tried to stay out of his way and just relied on his good graces to get spots there. He would have a table in the restaurant section of the club where, where the 
the inner circle would would meet and schmooze and stuff like that. I was never part of that, but I always <laughs> looked looked at them longingly. And uh, Kevin Nealon was the bartender at the time that I was there. He wow. wasn't even doing stand up comedy yet. Wow. Yeah, he's somebody that my buddies know from Connecticut, and he said, you know, look Kevin up. We never we never really got too close, although he was very nice, and uh, it was great to see him kind of go from. You know, everybody remembers him being the bartender. It's really interesting. Well, I'm, I'm friends with him today. If you want me to put in a word and try to get him on your show, I, I'd be happy to do that. Please. I mean, he'll certainly remember me. Uh, uh, I would love it because uh, he's just one of the nice guys. And uh, I want to get everybody's vision and version of what the 80s were like. So you got on stage and that first time you went on stage, must have been a bit nerve-wracking at the improv. It yeah, both at the improv and the comedy store. I guess I was one of the uh, rare comedians that played both because there was a rivalry and each club owner resented comedians that would do the other. But maybe I was so far under the wire that they didn't notice. But I, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely nerve-wracking. But, but, you know, after a couple of times, you realize that funny is funny. And just because you're in... In, in, in the biggest city in the world for comedy doesn't mean you have to have butterflies. So I, I tried to tamp them down and, and, and plow on ahead. You know, one of those, uh, we, we just bought the fire stick. And one of those companies on the fire stick has a lot of the evening at the improvs. Uh -huh. So I'm going to steal one of your lines. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. How many people like me already? <laughs> right. But, but without the people, you know, it's economy of words. How many like me already? I blew it. That, that was always the opening line. It always worked. <laughs> oh, it was great to see everybody. I mean, I'm watching uh, all the guys, all the people I knew and seeing myself in the audience. And uh, yeah, so give me, give me a, give me the growth. Give me the growth from Bud saying, all right, you know, you can uh, stay. And uh, uh, what happened from there? I guess they saw me as uh, the, the opposite of Sam Kinison, whereas Sam Kinison would be put on very late at night because he Wake was- people up. Yes, he was a revolution, a screamer, revolution. And I was seen as more the, the quiet, gentle writer type. So I, I often got the early eight, in the- Eight, eight, eight thirty, nine o'clock. Yeah, when the audience was filing in and ordering drinks and stuff like that, which I think was just as challenging as dealing with drunks at the end of the night, because they're not warmed up, they're not even paying attention, but those are the spots I got. And eventually, if, if you get better, or if you get some more interest in you, 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 you get uh, better spots. But uh, I enjoyed it all and was also uh, in my side uh, time writing uh, spec scripts, sample scripts for sitcoms, thinking I'd like to explore uh, that arena as well. So when you went on the road, maybe when some guys uh, went to the movies and uh, looked for something to do, you were writing probably. Yes, always uh, writing and reading. I'm not a, a club person and, and I'm still shy, although uh, you're relaxing me very much. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. You know, I, it's I've been interviewing people for you know a long time and I've had some people say to me, oh, I was scared to death, but I really had a good time with you. And listen, it's something, it helps that I was there with you. It helps that I was a part of it. I had a lot of the same memories, except I was down here and you, know, you were up there behind this, the, the stage. Tell me about some of the relationships. We get past Jay. Did you warm up to anybody else? Did others warm up to you? I know, listen, I know it was a camaraderie and I know everybody liked each other, but did the friendships uh, come along with it also? I don't know if I call them friendships so much as uh, working relationships with people in the field, but I, I started writing regularly as did so many uh, comedians, including Jay Leno and David Letterman for Jimmy Walker. He had uh, staffs of comedy writers uh, and in my group was Robert Schimmel and Louis Anderson. Oh, and wow. We would, meet, we would meet regularly at the basement of 
uh, Jimmy Walker's San Vicente Boulevard townhouse once a week and bring him 50 jokes on assigned topics. And he would read them one by one and say yes or no, or give us uh, withering glances if they were lame and that sort of thing. But it was, it was great uh, training and great fun and uh, income to be counted on while we did it. You know, he wasn't the only one that did that. There were others doing that too, right? Uh, there may have been. Yeah, there were. I remember guys telling me that they would have to come up with 10 or 20 jokes and then they would all uh, introduce them to whoever was paying $25 a joke at the time. Mm -hmm. and it, was, it, it was a way for, listen, 25 bucks back then, you know, you can go and have dinner. That's, that's right. You know who I did hit it off with? Your, uh, your old roommate, Barry Martyr. Oh, I want to hear all about that. We ended up collaborating on, on a couple of uh, uh, funny movie ideas in the vein of Airplane. Uh, one called Flattery Will Get You Nowhere about a inept uh, detective named uh, Flattery. And, and another one called E-I-E-I-O, The Motion Picture. It was a spoof of all those farm comedies that were coming out with Sally Field and stuff like that. And he and I also uh, were hired by Gabe Kaplan to write some special comedy material. Oh yeah, he was friendly with Gabe. He, uh, he used to run with Gabe a lot before he started running with Jerry. Uh, yeah. Listen, he, he's a smart guy and he knows that uh, everybody needs a, a funny man around them because a lot of them weren't all that funny and always needed fresh jokes. Right, and for those who don't know who we're talking about with Barry Martyr, they may be familiar with the name Ted L. Nancy. And he he's wrote a series of books about sending uh, goofy complaint letters to businesses and the serious replies he got back from the businesses. Letters to a nut, letters from a nut. He got a whole, like six of them or more. Wow. Yeah. But uh, his stand-up made me laugh more than anybody. Uh. Uh, but he was hilarious. Uh, I used to go on the road with him. Here's a great memory for me. Barry opened up for Murray, Murray Langston, the unknown comic. Yeah. And we, it, Murray took us both probably to, uh, to, to Dallas, I believe it was. Boy, I tell you, I got an education on being around a fun, Barry's not, you know, funny to everybody, but Murray is he loves people and he is funny and man did we have a great weekend when those guys worked together in uh in in dallas and another one and i just heard the sad news i said what about roger and roger because barry used to open up for those guys and open we and we went out to phoenix one weekend and then somebody i think maybe uh, slayton said to me neither one of them are here Oh, man. So, you know, it's you got to get this information down when you can, because you, you just never know uh, when people's times are up. I, I'm going to try to get Silver Friedman on the show. Zoe said, okay. Zoe said she would do the show, and I haven't quite heard from her since, but wouldn't that be interesting to get the point of view from, uh, from Silver? Yes, that would be great. And you didn't have any of that experience in New York. I, I took a trip into New York and did a guest spot at the Improv and at Catch a Rising Star, but uh, that was it. It was just very brief. So you really had a different experience. You were, you know, having that writing uh, brought you in, you know, in, in, in different directions. Uh, but if you have some of the memories of when you went on stage and who went on before you and who went on after, you know, that's what I... I would love to hear your impression, your memories of some of the, uh, you know, some of the guys that did great, maybe some of the guys that didn't do some great. And listen, we don't have, I'm, I'm here to make everybody feel good, but I also want to know what went on behind that curtain. I'm afraid your questions have to be a little more specific than that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just trying to find out from your point of view, what it was like to be a part of it, because you were not only a part of it in San Francisco, but you ingratiated yourself and were a big part of the 80, 80s golden age of comedy at the Improv, and you did Evening at the Improv. So 
you know, when you were there, there must have been a lot of good experience. I love hearing your experience about you and Bud. And, uh, you know, what about the other L.A. comics? Were they open to you uh, being a guy from San Francisco uh, when you did come on board other than Jay? I, I didn't get any uh, pushback from that. I think a lot of comedians came from other places. Very few of them were solely, uh, you know, Los Angeles comedians. Um, my experience with Jimmy Walker emboldened me to approach other comedians who, and uh, many of them were open to uh, written material. Um, I, I sold one joke to Rodney Dangerfield. That was a, a highlight of my life. And I don't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, I know my daughter's loose. Guy in a bar asked what her sign was. She said, yield. <laughs> Maybe it was Rodney that was paying guys for jokes. I think it was when he was out in LA. I think he was one of the guys that would collect three, four, five, six guys and, and hear their jokes. Yeah, that could be. I, I had I had in my, um, are you petting your dog? Yeah. <laughs> he likes comedy too. Uh, I had, uh, I was honored to have Jim Carrey in my kitchen for a joke writing session. Oh, wow. Um, Howie Mandel. Um, uh, did a little bit for Robin. Uh, there, were, there were a number of them. Oh, Pat Paulson. Oh, did, wow. Did writing for him. So if you don't mind, tell me a little bit about being with them alone writing comedy. I mean, everybody thinks they know uh, Robin. Everybody thinks they know some of the guys that you just mentioned. But, you know, when it was just you and them, what, what was it? Give me, give me run, run it through with a few of those guys. Well, I'll, I'll use Roseanne as an example because I had a few sessions with her and I don't have the kind of mind generally where I like to just go cold into a meeting and sit with them and come out with stuff. I like to be more prepared than that. Uh, so what, what I would do is come watch them do stand up and then talk to them afterwards and say, do you wanna do more of what you're doing now? Or do you wanna go in a different direction? what topics do you want me to work on for new jokes? And then I would go home and uh, agonize over coming up with some wonderful new material for them, then meet with them, go over that together. And in going over that together, they would either love it or it would spark other directions. Of, I, I had a similar session with Gary Shandling and that was wonderful too. Um, so that, that's how I like to work, just prepare first and, and then present and then take it from there. What was Gary like? Uh, very funny always uh, and very, uh, very sensitive and kind and warm, I found him to be. Yeah, he, he, uh, he had quite a degree of success. Yeah, a successful sitcom writer and wrote for uh, Welcome Back Cotter before even getting into stand-up. So uh, I guess I did the opposite, did the stand-up first and then wrote for the sitcoms. So you also wrote for Mr. Cotter himself. Uh, I know that uh, he and Barry got along real well. How was that for you? Uh, briefly, the memory I have of that is going to his home. I think it was like in Bel Air or Brentwood, one of those places. And uh, he had dogs, like vicious German dogs that Jews are afraid of. And they would be fiercely barking when we arrived and he had to call them off. And then we went in and, and he was very uh, kind, a little cold, but very uh, kind to us. So I uh, enjoyed that. It was special material for some, some presentation that he was doing in Vegas or someplace. Yeah, he got very interested in, uh, I think, Texas Hold'em after a while. And he, was, he became quite good at it. Yes, yeah. Interesting guy. I mean, the New Yorker, you know, I, you know, he, there's a guy that uh, or li lived a good life and he's still living a good life, thank God. So what, was, what would you say would be the pinnacle? What was the highest point for you in your show business career that you could say, wow, this is really cool? I don't know if there was one high point, but there was a series of uh, appealing min medium points that, that I like very much. And one would probably be uh, getting on TV for the first time. And I did a series of standard performances on, on different kinds of talk shows. 
but the first time you're going to be on TV, that's really exciting. Let's Getting stop there. I want to hear about that because I can't imagine when you said, oh, you were a performer. Uh, uh, I can't imagine going out on a Carson stage or a Letterman stage with three cameras, blinding lights and people. I couldn't mm. even imagine what that must have been like. Yeah, I can't either because I was never on those shows. Well, I, yeah, okay, I knew that. The shows that, <laughs> the shows that I did do, uh, you know, I, I did uh, uh, Evening at the Improv might have been uh, the first, but if it wasn't, it was probably Norm Crosby's Comedy Shop. And uh, the guy that uh, introduced me was um, Phil Silvers. Oh. And I, I have the tape of it. And at the end, when I come over and talk to him and Norm, at, at the very end, he you can see him giving me a kiss on the cheek, Phil Silver. Oh. That was the best. Did you get to know him a little bit? I'd love to hear about what he was like behind the stage there. I would love to hear that too, but it was they, they shuttled me out of there pretty quick. And then uh, I, I was on Star Search. I, I think it was like the third show they ever did of Star Search. Uh, which was comedians and singers. And, and I was the first comedian I was told to get four stars, which was the highest you could get from all three or four judges, which was nice. The problem is on a show like that, you come back the next week and you're doing your second best batch of material against somebody doing their first batch of material. And, and I, think, I think the guy that won uh, that season, Brad Garrett. Oh, Brad Garrett, right. Yeah. yeah. Wow, and he went on to do some good stuff. Yes, yes, very talented guy. Love his, love his acting, love his stand-up. So are you in a position now where some of the work you've done is residual kind of work for you at all? Residual meaning you get residuals from it? Yes. If I do, I could buy you a, a, a nice candy bar. Yes. As you know, residuals diminish over the years. But, uh, you know, that's when... Uh, marketing writing came along to save the day. Thank God. And are you in a relationship now? We need to talk a little bit about that because no one is more famous than you talking about finding a relationship. So, uh, oh, that would be another uh, high point for me. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, the first time I was hired on staff for a sitcom, which was The New Odd Couple, it was a Gary Marshall show, and it was the black version of The Odd Couple, starring Ron Glass and Damond Wilson, and it was at Paramount, and that was thrilling, being on a, a studio set and being a regular part of a staff of writers. That would have been a high point, and, and back to your thing about the relationships and dating, getting a book published by a legitimate uh, mainstream publisher, it was a collection of my humor essays I had done for uh, the Los Angeles Times on my dating ex online dating experiences, and it's available now on Amazon. Hey, you know we were about to ask, called uh, 500 Dates: Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Online Dating Wars." And it's a collection of my humor essays on on dating, along with some fantasy pieces I did for a publication called Weekly World News. It was a forerunner of the Onion, and it was, you know, how Trump keeps talking about fake news. This was. Uh, actual fake news, a publication that wrote fake news stories and tried to make them sound as real as possible. So I have some of those that are more dating and romance oriented in the book along with my own humor essays. So have you gotten any extra attention on the book to possibly make it into a, a sitcom or a screenplay? No. <laughs> I have not. So uh, feel free to run with it. I think I, I think part of the problem is it's not one you know storyline thing. It's a, it's a series of vignettes, so it would be that sort of thing. But it's available for any foresighted genius producer who wants to do something with that. Well, I, if I find that guy, I will definitely. Uh, you'll always <laughs> be in the in the at least the background of my mind. So I want to ask: Is there? Is there anything else you'd like to share with us that will help bring the 80s golden age of comedy, uh, you know, via Mark Miller? I think there's no reason to limit what you're doing to this show. I, I, I 
think this could be a movie, a documentary, a series, a pop-up book, whatever you feel it could lead to because you're accumulating a lot of good raw material and historical material. And I'm gonna use it on stage. I'll steal everybody's material. <laughs> Excellent. No, I, I, I look back on it as a really special time. I feel fortunate to have been uh, part of it and, uh, and, and to have you be part of it too. So uh, uh, very lucky. Well, thanks. You know, we have kept in touch over the years through some of our other things that we were doing with relationships and we've spoken and talked throughout the years. And uh, I'm just happy to see somebody happy, made it out of show business, you know, because it, it, it was it was such a high time for so many people. And at the at the end of the at the end of the hour here, with this terrible change that we're going through, even people that were hanging on and doing the cruise ships and still going on the road, oh my goodness, they lost the cruise ships and they lost the road. It's a it's a oh, I mean, listen, I've struggled. I, I, I know what it is to struggle, but when you talk and work with guys that have had such a high life and for them to uh, have to be so sober, go through some sobering times is a little heartbreaking for me. Uh, there's this guy, uh, Steve Lubetkin, who, who jumped off the Hyatt Regency to his death uh, because he, he couldn't get the stage time he wanted at, at the comedy store. Uh, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking. I, I think the key to longevity and success and mental stability is to be able to pivot because if you choose to go into show business, it, it's, you can expect nonstop rejection and unless you're extremely talented and extremely lucky at the same time. But for, for most of us, we, we have to be, become skilled at a number of things and, and consider other options all the time. And, and you can't let uh, you, you can't let one disappointment uh, drag you down. If you find that's the case, call me and I'll talk you down off the ledge. Yeah, no, you know, I've gone through enough of them and I, I love, I've also gone through a lot of pivoting. Yes. And uh, one of the ways I pivoted is that when I left LA the second time, I went back, we, we talked briefly about uh, remembering that Rodney left the business for 10 years. Oh, I'd love to talk about that little part there that Rodney left the business for 10 years. And I don't know what he was like before when he gave up, but he actually went back to New Jersey and started selling aluminum siding. And then he came back. I'd love to hear your version of remembering how that was for him after he came back. So he was a guy named Jack Roy when in the early part of his career. And I guess he was a like a journeyman comic and he was doing this and that, but nothing was really happening. And then all of a sudden he found himself married and with kids, he had to support them and make an income, but no income was coming. So he, he, he chose the responsible route and, and got a job selling aluminum siding. And uh, when he came back, I guess he had gotten smarter in those 10 years. So uh, he, he, I'm speculating, he said to himself, how can I distinguish myself from all the other journeymen comedians who aren't gonna make it because the, there's a similarity to them. Uh, and he, he decided on giving himself some sort of personality or hook. And, and that was the, uh, from, from his actual life. I don't get no respect, uh, poor me, the, the, the hangdog thing, everybody dumps on me and, and that hooked into the audience and, and led to his success. You really do need that hook. I remember watching Howie Mandel uh, so many times up at the comedy store and he was doing some real different things. He was doing some stuff with talcum powder that yeah. thank, I, I hope he didn't get sick from that because it's, you know, ended up being a bad thing, but he was, and he was blowing balloons up on his head. I remember he, he, he took a big balloon, a glove and he, he just blew up this big, big, big until it got as big as a house. I mean, he, he was brilliant because he would go from one side of the stage to the other, talk to this guy over here, talk to that guy over there. And he would find a way to blend stories in and, and bring this guy in with, I mean, listen, when you're up on stage and you could remember anything, it's, it's pretty amazing. So he had a brilliant mind and I, 
I've said it a lot to him. By the way, if you can get me Howie now, I'll accept him to come on the show. But he married, married to the same woman for, you know, 40 something years now. Yes. And uh, just a genuinely great guy who, you know, has a lot of talent. We talked about pivoting. When I left show business a second time, I moved to a tropical island in the Western Caribbean. Why? Because I always wondered what it would be like to live on a tropical island in the Western Caribbean, my goodness. And at first it was very difficult. But when I moved to the island, I realized that there were no English speaking talk radio show hosts. They played a little English music, played a lot of Spanish music. And I said, wow, no English talk here. And I went and talked to the guy who owned the station. And for the next uh, eight or nine years, I was the first and only English speaking, uh, like just like the Larry King of the Western Caribbean. And I interviewed all sorts of presidents of the countries and hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of governors and mayors and congressmen and any, any person who came to visit the island, I grabbed them for the show. Bruce Smirnoff came on the show. And we talked for an hour about comedy when he was here on one of, when he was there on one of the cruises. So I understand when you say about pivoting, I've certainly had to do it a lot. And this right here, I started about two years ago and now it's really gaining momentum and I'm very excited about it. I'll be working with Glenn uh, Hirsch and I'm sorry he couldn't make it here uh, today. And uh, he's gonna be bringing on a bunch of guys that you know he's friendly with. And we're gonna probably have you know, 20 or 30 guys easily doing the show over the next uh, several months. So I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate your suggestion. And if you have any more great ideas like that, please send them my way. And also, if you know any of the guys out there that uh, would want to, you know, talk about their days and reminisce, they don't have to be world famous. It's just someone who, uh, who dared to, to man that stage in the 80s and the 70s. I'd love to talk to them. So I, if, you, if they mention your name, you know, I, uh, they've got entree here. Will do. And how about incorporating some of those island videos into these uh, shows as well? <laughs> a little different. A little different. It wasn't much humor. It wasn't much comedy. Uh, it was a pretty... Uh, but I did play a lot of great music. And I, I, I came into loving uh, music all over again and, and, and uh, bands and singers that I really didn't pay much attention to before. It was really a great time in my life. But, you know, I do like show business. I just don't like being on stage like you were. I give you a whole lot of credit for being able to do that, especially because you're not, you know, one of the wild and crazy outgoing guys. You probably had to fight it every minute to get up there. What was it like right before you went up on stage? I mean, how did you rally the forces to do it? I think uh, it was the most terrifying just the first few times I did it when I was first starting out. But once you've gotten the, the, the laps and, and can expect them, it gets a little less so each time. But there's still a healthy degree of, of uh, fear and uh, upset stomach a little bit. I think it lessens over time and you start to enjoy it and feed on that energy. That's what keeps people doing it for years and loving it. You feed off the love and the energy from the people and the occasional hecklers. And one last question along those lines. I'm sure there was a time when you were in front of the wrong audience. Maybe you were opening for someone that wasn't the right audience for you. And maybe you were a little off. I don't know if the audience is all ever off, but tell me about that one time in your life, maybe more, but just one time when it didn't go well. The one I remember is, you, you know, the, it's very hip audiences in, in LA, the nightclub audiences. But when you start touring and going around the country, you see it's, it's, it's more of uh, uh, slightly less hip, more religious, more conservative. So I have a routine where uh, I was saying, you know, it's, it's remarkable to me how many of our modern pop songs come directly from the Bible. And as an example, I, I pick up a Bible and I say, for example, from the book of Genesis, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, 
knock three times on the ceiling if you want me. So I, I did several of those in the bit. And at the end, when I come down into the audience to meet the audience and say hi, one uh, very conservative, angry looking woman comes up to me and says, and I quote, you're going to burn in hell. And she walks away. Wow. Well, I, I'm, I'm not positive that's that won't be the case, but I haven't let it obsess me. Well, that's good because, you know, you can't let that one, you know, real negative experience uh, shut you off. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for doing this with me. This has been great. We've done a whole hour, believe it or not. And uh, I still have 25 more minutes scheduled, but I understand you have a limit to your. Yeah, shows. I've got the next comedian <laughs> up next. No, I don't. But, I see the red light on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So listen, thank you so much. This was great. I do appreciate your time. Mark Miller, longtime stand-up comedian and thank writer, you. sitcom I writer. <laughs> I will do that, and I'll even send it to your island to see if they'll give me a show. Oh. Well, I think that if you go there, you might have a shot because they've never been able to replace me. <laughs> Understood. Don't tell them I said that. Mark Miller, God bless, Thank buddy. You. We'll Thanks see you everybody. again. Look for more Bruce Star Show, 80s golden age of comedy. And you take care, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye, everybody.